A young girl playing in her yard in Spokane, Washington, suddenly vanishes. In St. Louis, another girl leaves to visit a friend. She never arrives. Horrified parents worry their children have been abducted, or worse. When children go missing without a trace, detectives must use knowledge, experience, and science to find them and apprehend those who intend to harm them. In this episode, some of the names have been changed. In Spokane, Washington, it's usually the sounds of nature that greet residents each morning. But on the morning of October 18, 1999, one neighborhood was awakened by the voice of 33-year-old Brad Jackson. Valerie? Valerie? Valerie! He was frantically calling out the name of his nine-year-old daughter, Valerie. Valerie? Valerie! The distraught father knocked on neighbors' doors, desperate to know if anyone had seen his daughter. Valerie! Did you see my daughter? Did you see Valerie? Valerie! At 8.44, he called 911 to report Valerie missing. Daughter's missing. How long has she been gone? Can I be named, sir? Within moments, deputies from the Spokane County Sheriff's Department responded to the call. Jackson told them that he had last seen Valerie playing in the yard at about 8.15. Several minutes later, when he came outside to walk her to school, Valerie's backpack was on the porch, but she was nowhere to be found. Okay, she's, she's gone. Is there anybody else she's authorized to go with? Another adult or a relative? No. Okay, stand by. We're going to get some more officers out here. Okay. Sheriff's deputies and neighbors began searching the area in hopes that Valerie had decided to walk to school on her own or went to a friend's house. Valerie! Once those possibilities were investigated and ruled out, the search effort grew more intensive. A canine unit was called to the scene. Handlers scented the dogs with one of Valerie's shirts. Yeah, what was the circumstance? But their tracking turned up nothing. She's out playing in the yard and Spokane County Sheriff's Valerie! Detective Dave Madsen was on the scene. Anytime a child disappears, uh, searching the residence for anything is very important to see if there's any evidence of foul play at the scene itself. Has anybody noticed anything out of the ordinary this morning? In this case, the residence belonged not to Brad Jackson, but to his parents, Dick and Karen Jackson. Brad and Valerie had been living with Karen and Dick, his parents, for about seven months. Well, we moved in here because my girlfriend doesn't give Jackson, Valerie. a single father with sole custody of Valerie, explained that he and his daughter had previously been living at his girlfriend's home. They moved back in with his parents because the girlfriend did not get along with Valerie. Valerie's mother had not been seen by anyone in the family for several years. Madsen questioned Jackson and his parents about when they last saw Valerie. His father, Dick, said he saw her the prior evening. Before she went to bed, oh, we, we talked and hugged, and, and she uh, asked me uh, if I was going to work. I worked in Portland. She asked me if I was leaving in the morning, and uh, she asked when she would see me again, 
and uh, I told her the following week, but that was the last time I seen her. Jackson's mother, Karen, had seen Valerie at about 4.30 on the morning of her disappearance. I usually, before I left for work, I'd go in and, and always make sure, you know, give her a little hug and kiss, which I did, and then I left for work. I found she was gone. Brad Jackson told police again that he had seen Valerie playing in the yard before school. But about 15 minutes later, she was gone. I mean, she has be okay if we took a look in Valerie's room? Sure. The Jacksons gave investigators permission to look around the house for anything that might explain what happened to Valerie. You never know what you're going to find. You look for things that are out of place in their room. Madsen examined Valerie's bed. He discovered blood spots on a pillow. Oddly, there was no blood on the case. Where's there blood on the pillow here? Sometimes Jackson said his daughter had a nosebleed the night before. Valerie did have nosebleeds, and usually when she did, she'd go to her dad and have her daddy help her take care of him. Jackson explained that Valerie got upset when she saw blood on her bedding. So he had washed and replaced the bedding just prior to Valerie's disappearance. Madsen looked for other evidence of a nosebleed, such as a bloody tissue, but found none. He instructed crime technicians to collect both the pillows and bed sheets for further examination. While searching the house, Madsen made a potentially important discovery. Valerie's diary. He instructed crime technicians to bag and collect it. Outside, police continued knocking on doors and asking neighbors if they saw or knew anything about Valerie's disappearance. No one had any helpful information. The neighbors told police Brad Jackson seemed like a devoted father and that Valerie was a very sweet girl. Madsen had three possible theories of what might have happened to Valerie. The first was that she was abducted by an unknown abductor. Uh, the second being that maybe her birth mother or someone for her birth mother had came in took her. And then the third was that a family member had caused her to disappear and that narrowed down to Brad. To try to prove his suspicions, Madsen turned his attention to the items recovered from the house. He found some disturbing entries in Valerie's diary. She was upset with her dad over a birthday party that she just had like about two weeks before uh, and he embarrassed her and then there was notations that he wasn't respecting her privacy like in her bedroom and was just coming in unannounced. Less than a week before her disappearance, Valerie wrote about her father, he won't leave me alone in my room. There wasn't anything really concrete, but it did raise a red flag. Madsen had Jackson's pickup truck towed to the sheriff's department. It was processed by forensic specialist Craig Coppock. Take a swab of this. We approach it in a, in a methodical fashion so that we don't overlook any evidence. Uh, in this particular case, uh, we were looking for uh, soil, hair fiber, body fluids. Coppock first examined the exterior of the vehicle. He discovered several mysterious spots on the front passenger side bumper. He swabbed the residue in order to send it out for testing. For the truck's interior search, the door was pulled shut and the garage lights were turned off. We 
used a forensic light source or an alternate light source uh, to view the interior of the vehicle. Certain things such as body fluids and hairs and fibers will fluoresce so we can uh, document it and collect them. Other than the mysterious residue on the bumper, no significant evidence was recovered from the truck. They would have to wait to see what the residue was. As investigators tried to make sense of the scant evidence, they feared they were wasting precious time. Valerie, Valerie. Valerie Jackson was missing. Valerie. And if police didn't find her soon, Valerie. they feared their missing persons case might become a homicide. In Spokane, Washington, nine-year-old Valerie Jackson had been missing for more than a week. The police had very little to go on. But they suspected that the girl's father, Brad Jackson, had something to hide. Madsen asked him if he'd take a polygraph exam. Jackson consented. It was administered by Larry Miller. Did you cause the disappearance of your daughter on October 18th? No. On October 18th, were you the one who made your daughter disappear? No. The results of Brad Jackson's polygraph test clearly indicated that he was being deceptive to the relevant questions. The relevant questions included the specific issue of whether or not he was involved, responsible for the disappearance of his daughter on October 18th, and whether or not he knew the location of his daughter at the present time. No. As the results of the polygraph exam are not admissible in court, Jackson was released after taking no. the exam. If Jackson had no. harmed his daughter, then Madsen and his team would have to prove it. Okay, bringing everyone up today. Madsen gathered a team of detectives to plan the next move. The test results from the mysterious residue found on the truck's bumper tested positive for human blood. Brad's tentatively going to take a polygraph. Time was running out, and the investigators were beginning to fear they would never find Valerie Jackson alive. They believed that if they followed Jackson, he might inadvertently lead them to the evidence they needed. But putting a full-time surveillance team on him would be nearly impossible. They had to find another way. We've got his truck. Why don't we put GPS on his vehicles? Someone came up with the idea of using the GPS to track his vehicle movements. Uh, we decided we were going to try to do that. The ultimate goal was hopefully for him to lead us to where Valerie was. Uh, secondary goal was to find out who he was contacting and so we could contact those people to do follow-up interviews with them in regards to anything they may know about the case or what Brad was doing. If working properly, the GPS unit would transmit a signal to orbital satellites. Detective Don McCabe could then download that information on his computer and track everywhere Jackson's truck traveled in real time. And that is printed out in uh, latitude and longitude, date and time. It'll give you an address if you want the address. Right before you leave, I need With the unit installed, Madsen called Jackson to pick up his truck. The investigation team would now have to hope Jackson would lead them to Valerie. As he was handing over the keys, Madsen made a bold move. I told him point blank that I knew he'd killed Valerie, and I knew that he probably buried her, that he didn't have time to bury her deep enough, that animals would dig her up, and we would find her body, and when we did, we would have the evidence we needed to convict him of murdering Valerie. His only reaction, and he no emotion, no nothing, just looked straight at me and said, I understand. Jackson took the keys and drove off. And Detective McCabe was tracking his every move. Over the first couple of days, the GPS unit worked perfectly, and McCabe knew where Jackson's truck was at all times. Then, suddenly, the signal was lost. He could no longer watch Jackson in real time. McCabe would have to wait a few weeks and hope the unit was still recording the data. Don McCabe in Spokane. Hey, I'm having a problem. Uh, I can't bring up the uh, tracker. I've tried everything. If the information was there, he would have to download it after the unit was taken off the truck. 
pictures in any way that you can think of. After more than two weeks, Madsen decided it was time to try to retrieve the tracking information. He got a warrant for deputies to seize Jackson's truck. Detective McCabe then removed the GPS unit. And with Matson at his side, he began downloading the data. To their relief, within moments, the exact routes of Jackson's travels were displayed on a computer monitor. There were um, a couple of uh, places that really stuck out as, gee, that's a strange place for him to be. Uh, and one of the places was Vacari Road. Is he going across I-90 in the Bargon now? Yeah. Vicari Road was located in a remote wilderness area 20 miles outside of Spokane. Where he was the other day. He was there on the uh, 10th of November for about 15 minutes, just short of 15 minutes. He then went directly from there up to the Springdale area where he spent another almost 30 minutes uh, in that area before coming back to Spokane. Springdale was also a remote and wooded location. It was an old abandoned logging site. Madsen believed these two stops meant his blunt warning to Jackson might have worked. Perhaps Jackson had buried his daughter's body at Vicari Road after her death. Now, fearing the body would be found, he exhumed it and buried it again in Springdale. Everything else is in town. Madsen assembled a team of investigators and took off for Vicari Road. Using a handheld GPS unit, Madsen located the exact spot where Jackson parked his truck. This is the GPS location where the vehicle stopped. He then instructed his team to fan out over the area, looking for disturbed soil, footprints, clothing, or anything else out of the ordinary. The team included a cadaver dog and his handler. After only a few minutes, the dog picked up a scent near some overturned soil, a potential grave site. Change over here. He's liking this. All right, let's get him out of there. Kevin? Madsen called forensic scientist Kevin Jenkins to the spot. Jenkins noticed a boot print. It was pretty obvious when we got there. Um, we just had to make sure not to disturb it. Um, once we were ready to process it, um, we used what's called dental stone. Um, it's a, a, a hard plaster um, mixed with water at the scene and poured onto the site. Jenkins made a cast of the print. Knowing that later on it could be compared and possibly matched to boots owned by Jackson. Another forensic scientist, Bill Schneck, collected several soil samples from the area. We wanted to look at the soil samples and compare it to any other physical evidence that may be in the suspect's environment, say his house or any tools or clothing that he may have. Just as the team was getting ready to leave, they made another discovery. One of the investigators dug up two plastic grocery bags stuck together with duct tape. The bags appeared to be blood-stained, and hair was stuck to the duct tape. It was red hair, the same color as Valerie Jackson's. But they didn't find a body. It led us to believe that uh, most likely Valerie had been buried there and removed most recently. Madsen and his team moved on to the second site Jackson had driven to days earlier in Springdale. They hoped that here they would find the evidence they so desperately sought. If not, 
they feared a suspected murderer would go free. In Spokane, Washington, nine-year-old Valerie Jackson had been missing for nearly a month. Her father, Brad Jackson, was the primary suspect. Investigators used GPS to locate a possible burial site for the missing girl. It was a heavily wooded, abandoned logging site. This is where the GPS coordinates stop. Investigator Dave Madsen's entire case depended on whether Valerie was buried somewhere in these woods. We felt all along that if Brad was involved, there was no other explanation other than she was going to be dead. He directed the team to first inspect the roadside for evidence. Almost immediately, they spotted tire tracks leading into the woods. Kevin? Forensic scientists Kevin Jenkins and Bill Schneck made a plaster cast of the track. Later on, they would compare the tire tread impression in the cast to the tires on Jackson's truck. The team then spread out and walked through the woods looking for overturned dirt or any other sign that might lead them to Valerie. Suddenly, a cadaver dog picked up a scent and led its handler to the origin. Madsen was called over and saw that the spot contained loose, overturned soil. The forensics team began a very delicate excavation of the site. Within moments, they found what they were looking for. Hey Dave, why don't you come here a minute? We got something. Pink fabric, like the sweater Valerie was last seen in, and human tissue. Looks like there's some. The body of a young girl was then removed from the gravesite. It was later identified as that of Valerie Jackson. Looks like. It was very quiet when we found Valerie, uh, yeah, when she was finally covered in the gravesite. You always want to find a child alive when they're missing. It was what we probably expected, but it was still, there was grief and remorse in regards to it because the finality, I guess, sunk in with people that she was in fact dead. And so, yeah, it was a sad moment. With the recovery of Valerie's body, the investigation was far from over. The forensics team did another search of Jackson's home. They seized items that could potentially be linked to the evidence collected in the field. A roll of duct tape, two shovels, and a pair of boots belonging to Brad Jackson. Forensic scientist Bill Schneck, who had collected soil samples from both the Vicari Road and Springdale sites, was now collecting dirt from the wheel wells and floor of Jackson's truck. By comparing soil samples from the truck and the crime scenes, we're looking for similarities in composition to see if the soil from the uh, vehicles could have come from the crime scene. At the same time, Kevin Jenkins was making an impression of the truck's tire to see if it matched the one cast at the site where Valerie's body was recovered. To get a known impression from Jackson's truck, we apply a thin coat of petroleum jelly to the tire. We then very slowly roll the tire over a white artboard. Um, this applies the impression of the tire in the petroleum jelly onto the white artboard. We then can use black magnetic fingerprint powder to enhance that impression and make it darker. As the investigation continued to move forward, the county medical examiner performed an autopsy on Valerie Jackson. Her report listed the cause of death as suffocation. Back at the state crime lab, Kevin Jenkins was comparing the tire impression taken from Jackson's truck to the cast he made in the field. Ultimately, what we hope to find is what's called an accidental characteristic. An accidental characteristic is a nick or a cut, something that's not there from the manufacturer of the tire um, or is there on many, many tires, something individual to that tire. Um, if we can find that, then we will be able to say that that tire made that impression to the exclusion of all others. 
Jenkins declared they were an exact match. Matching up the tire print from the Jackson's vehicle to the tire print from the Springdale site, from the second burial site, uh, was very important because it helped us to establish that Brad Jackson or that vehicle had been in that area. Investigators had now placed Jackson's truck at the scene. Now they had to place him there. Forensic scientists began comparison testing on nearly two dozen soil samples collected from both grave sites and Jackson's boots, shovels, and truck. Bill Schneck conducted the test. The soil analysis is rather significant because it tied the suspect, uh, Jackson, to the grave site where Valerie was found. There was soil on his boots, soil on shovels, which was similar to the soil from the grave, so it actually tied him going to the grave. Forensic examiners were also able to lift fingerprints off the grocery bags from the Vicari Road site. The prints came back as a match to Brad Jackson. Madsen's case against Brad Jackson was now complete. Obviously, the GPS was the biggest turning point. Without the GPS, there was a good chance we never would have found Valerie, and we may never have had the evidence to convict Brad in regards to this case. During the course of the investigation, Brad Jackson threatened to take his own life. He was now being held at a local hospital on suicide watch. Doctors approved his release, and Madsen arrested him for the murder of his daughter. Police may never know why Jackson killed his daughter. He has never spoken about the crime. On October 5th, 2000, a jury found Brad Jackson guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced him to 56 years in prison. I was very pleased that the jury convicted him, but I was also sad for his family because not only did they lose their granddaughter, and to Karen Jackson, Valerie was almost like a daughter, but they lost their son. So there was a lot of sadness for them. Taking the life of a child is an unconscionable act. It's a tragedy that can strike even the safest neighborhoods. St. Louis, Missouri is a good place to raise a family. At least, that's what Rhonda Center thought. A single mom who shared a home with her friend, Thomas Siegel. Rhonda was raising her 10-year-old daughter, Cassidy, here. On December 1st, 1993, Rhonda arrived home from work. She greeted Siegel and asked if he knew where Cassidy was. Siegel said she had gone to a friend's home and was due back at 5 o'clock. It was now 10 minutes after 5. Cassidy wasn't usually late, so Rhonda called the friend's home to check on her. Her friend said Cassidy never arrived. What do you mean? What are you talking about? She didn't make it. Are, are you sure? She said she never made it. She never made it. No, no. no. Well, we've got to go Rhonda her. asked Siegel to help her look for Cassidy. While Siegel walked up and down the street calling out for Cassidy, Rhonda went next door. She asked if the neighbor had seen Cassidy that afternoon. She had not. Cassidy! Siegel called the police. When the patrol car arrived, Siegel met it outside his house. Your roommate? He told the officer he last saw Cassidy at 3.30 and a neighbor reported seeing her at 3.45. She told Siegel she was going to a friend's house and would be back at 5 p.m., the same time her mother usually arrived home from work. Cassidy always carried a personal alarm when she went out to play. As he had done many times before, Siegel checked the alarm to be sure it was working. 
He confirmed it was, then told Cassidy he'd see her at five. She left and never returned. Siegel described for police what she was wearing. A blue denim jacket, a pink sweatshirt, jeans, and white sneakers. Officers began canvassing the neighborhood, asking if anyone had seen Cassidy or any unusual activity. A canine unit was also called in to try to pick up Cassidy's trail. A short time later, Detective Laura Nearing of the St. Louis County Police Department arrived to investigate. What made this case of particular interest was the fact that within the last two months before that, there were two other girls who were uh, missing and later found killed. It uh, brought it to our attention right away that we might be dealing with a serial offender. About a block and a half away, a man found a personal oh, yes, alarm so outside his home. Finding the um, personal alarm gave us more of an indication that uh, she was probably taken against her will as opposed to just uh, maybe being off with friends and not knowing about it. So it, uh, right away it started our focus as treating this as an, as an abduction as opposed to just a missing juvenile. The man who found the alarm had not witnessed any unusual activity. The investigators decided to check with the people next door to see if they had seen anything. No one answered the door. They would have to come back later. Rhonda recognized the personal alarm as Cassidy's. Nearing asked for a recent photo of Cassidy. She then asked for permission to look through Cassidy's room for any clues as to what might have happened to her. In Cassidy's bedroom, crime technicians began collecting items that might have her fingerprints or DNA on them. A hairbrush, a videotape, a glass from the bedside table. If the unthinkable had happened, the prints and DNA would be needed to identify Cassidy. Nearing also searched Cassidy's backpack looking through notebooks and reading notes passed between Cassidy and her friends. We knew she just came home from school. We wanted to see if we could get an indication of who she might have been talking to, where she planned to go. A lot of times kids will write notes to each other. Uh, they'll write uh, just their thoughts in books and things like that. Detective Nearing was meeting with a team of detectives known as the Greater St. Louis Major Case Squad, or MCS. The squad was already investigating the deaths of two other girls who were first reported missing just prior to Cassidy's disappearance. One victim was a girl close to Cassidy's age. The other was 22 years old. The MCS detective suspected there was a link among the three. So it was very important that we compare notes because as leads came in, if they weren't related to Cassidy Center, they could have been related to one of the other homicides, and those investigators needed to have that information also. If these cases were linked, then a serial killer was prowling the streets of St. Louis, preying on young women and girls. And until he was caught, no one was safe. In 1993, St. Louis police feared a serial killer was on the loose when 10-year-old Cassidy Center went to visit a friend after school and never arrived. She was the third girl to disappear. When news of her disappearance hit the papers, investigators printed new missing person flyers with a more recent photo of Cassidy and asked detectives to again canvass the neighborhood residents for information. Detective Nearing was especially interested in the house next door to the one where the personal alarm was found. 
detectives had gone there on a daily basis since Cassidy's disappearance, but never found anyone at home. Great, thanks. This time, nearly a week after Cassidy was reported missing, Gloria Cooper answered the door. Detectives asked about her whereabouts since the disappearance. Can you uh, tell me where you were? Cooper explained that she had to stay with some friends because the power company had cut off her electricity. It had only been turned on the day before. When asked about Cassidy, Cooper said she knew nothing. She also mentioned her brother, uh, who sometimes right, lived days, with her. Detectives went to talk with Cooper's brother. He told them because the electricity was off, he wasn't at the house the day she vanished. He had to be at work at 4 p.m. Do you have something to verify that you're at work? Sure, I mean, yeah, I got my time card. Brooks showed the detectives his time card from December 1st. He clocked in at 4.07 and clocked out at 11.30 p.m., potentially clearing Brooks as a suspect. Knowing that a neighbor saw her at 3.45 and he clocked in at 4.07, there wasn't much of a time there for someone to abduct somebody and, and potentially murder them in, in that short a span. Police hit another dead end. But on December 9th, eight days after Cassidy's disappearance, they got a break. Two teenagers were walking down a St. Louis alley when they noticed a bundle of blankets lying against a wall. As the boys approached, they were shocked to see a leg sticking out from the blankets. When the city police arrived, they immediately suspected that this was Cassidy and, and knew what was going on. So they called us right away, which helped. We were able to get down there and be part of uh, processing the scene and making sure all the evidence was obtained that we were going to need to help hopefully identify a suspect. The body, a young girl wearing clothing that matched Cassidy's, was wrapped inside a curtain underneath a blanket. The evidence at the scene didn't connect us to any particular person. Um, we knew we had uh, a comforter, a blanket, a curtain. Uh, we had these items, but we didn't know where, where they came from. Looks like we've got some tire tracks here. Yeah. Tire tracks were also found in the alley near the body. Stuff out there. Crime technicians took a dental stone cast of the track to use as evidence. Working from fingerprints taken from the victim, Detective Donald Bryan compared them to the print cards he made from the items recovered from Cassidy's room. Forensic scientists at the St. Louis Crime Lab examined the blanket found covering Cassidy for evidence that might lead them to the killer. They discovered several hairs that were later identified as coming from an African American. They also collected beige fibers and aluminum scrapings. We were able to take the uh, blankets and the curtains that she was found wrapped in. We were able to get pictures of that out. I believe that was even shown on the news that if anybody recognizes these items, to contact us. Investigators were still hoping for a lead that would point them okay. to the killer. And they feared they were running out of time. Detectives were determined to find Cassidy's killer before he struck again. Detectives in St. Louis, Missouri, found the body of 10-year-old Cassidy Center. She had been missing for eight days. They feared she was the latest victim of a serial killer. Cassidy was the third female killed in the last few months. But the theory that Cassidy's death was related to the other two was seeming less likely. 
the area of the city where she was disposed of was an inconsistent uh, pattern from what we would have expected with the other cases. Uh, believing that we were now uh, dealing with individual uh, perpetrators, we focused more on our case in particular rather than the collective evidence of all these cases. Investigators then turned to the strongest evidence they had, the African-American hair found with the body. Detectives went back to talk with Cassidy's neighbor, Gloria Cooper. Cooper had claimed she was not home at the time of the disappearance because the power company had turned off her electricity. Detective Laura Nearing, who was heading up the investigation, decided to confirm Cooper's story with a call to the power company. They really did have power the whole time. We were given information that uh, their story was incorrect and power had never been cut off to that house. So right away we're thinking, they're lying to us and why are they telling us they weren't there and why are they using that as an excuse? This new development prompted detectives to pay another visit to Gloria Cooper's home. This time, her boyfriend, Adam Jenkins, was with her. The detectives asked Jenkins where he was on the day Cassidy disappeared. He said he was out of town. Cooper then gave the detectives permission to look around the house. In one of the bedrooms, they made note of the beige carpeting. It was a similar color to the fibers found on the blankets covering Cassidy's body. There were also no curtains on the windows, nor bedclothes on the bed. If someone in the Cooper house was involved in the murder, then police would have to find a way to prove it. At the St. Louis Crime Lab, Detective Daniel Jackson was processing the tire impressions taken from the alley where Cassidy's body was found. After examining the tread characteristics, Jackson was able to determine the specific make of tire that made the track in the alley. It came out to be a tire that goes on certain types of uh, trucks, utility vehicles, vans, that sort of thing. After we learned the information uh, about the tire in particular and that it was a unique tire, it was important to identify what vehicles were in the area. Detectives again canvassed the neighborhood. How you doing, sir? Hey, how you doing? Their persistence seemed to pay off right away. One resident recalled that on December 9th, the day before Cassidy's body was discovered, he saw a rental truck in front of the Cooper's home at 6.30 a.m. Two African-American men got into the truck and sped off so fast that they struck a mailbox at the end of the driveway. When the information came back of this truck, a light bulb went on with us. We knew right away this is what we were looking for. We already knew that uh, within the bedding that our victim was found, there were aluminum shavings. We knew right away that this is probably our vehicle. Oh, here's one here. It was also the kind of truck that would have the type of tires that left the tracks in the alley where Cassidy was found. Now they needed to find it. Nearing checked the yellow pages for truck rental agencies. She found one located near Cooper's neighborhood and sent a detective to investigate. Cooper's brother, Thomas Brooks, rented the truck on December 8th and returned it on December 9th. The agent showed the detectives the specific truck Brooks rented. The truck was then impounded for processing. The tires were the same make as those identified through the cast impression taken from the crime scene. Comparing them to the plaster casts taken earlier, they found they were the exact tires. Detectives also vacuumed the inside of the truck for trace evidence that might match the paint and other shavings lifted from the blankets covering the body. The truck was dusted for prints.
Detective Nearing now had enough evidence to obtain a warrant for a more thorough search of Gloria Cooper's home. While searching Cooper's basement, one of the crime technicians found a pin. It was the same kind used on personal alarms like the one Cassidy carried. The technicians also identified, swabbed and collected several blood stains from the floor. At the St. Louis County Crime Lab, forensic scientist Alan Derrickson found a positive match between the blood found in Cooper's basement and Cassidy's DNA. Investigators next wanted to talk to the people who had access to Cooper's home. They brought in Adam Jenkins, Gloria Cooper's boyfriend. You know why we want to talk to you? It's about the little girl being killed. The detectives informed him that there was now solid evidence that someone from the Cooper's home killed Cassidy. Jenkins told the detectives the that Gloria Cooper didn't body. kill Cassidy, and she was murdered. but discovered her body in the basement. All she said was that there was... Jenkins went on to say that Cooper insisted her brother get rid of it. So Thomas Brooks rented a truck, and Jenkins helped him dispose of Cassidy's body in the St. Louis alley, where it was discovered. Did you ever go back to the house where your girlfriend was living? Detective Nearing then interrogated Gloria Cooper. Have I been talking to you? No. Nearing informed her that her boyfriend told them everything and that they even knew about the rental truck. We need your version. Cooper finally broke. I did, the only version I have... Okay, I came home... She admitted to finding Cassidy's body in the basement and demanding that Brooks remove it. She said she lied to detectives because her brother had threatened to hurt her children if she said anything. Cooper also confirmed that the blanket and curtain in the photos came from her house. She was then placed under arrest for obstruction of justice. Police then picked up Thomas Brooks at his father's home and brought him in for questioning. Brooks still denied any knowledge of the incident, but consented to give a hair sample. Tell me what happened. When detectives told him that Adam Jenkins rolled on him, his story changed. Brooks admitted the truth. He had tried to assault Cassidy. She fought with him, and he hit her with a bed slat, killing her. He covered her body with a blanket and hid her in the basement. Brooks then rushed to his job at the fast food restaurant, clocking in seven minutes late. After confessing, Brooks was placed under arrest. The hair sample Brooks gave to the detectives came up as a positive DNA match to the hair sample removed from the blanket Cassidy was found in. Thomas Brooks was convicted of first-degree murder and kidnapping. He was sentenced to death. Gloria Cooper and Adam Jenkins were both convicted on obstruction of justice charges. There will never be a way to ease the pain of loved ones left behind after a murder has been committed. But thanks to forensic science and its dedicated practitioners, justice is often served for the murders that result in stolen youth. New Jersey woman is found brutally murdered by the side of the road. Investigators must make their case from a few bite marks right. left on the victim's body. A sadistic predator targets young women in a quiet Canadian community. As police struggle to track him down, the killer threatens more victims. Indiana firefighters discover a woman murdered in her bed. But will dental impressions be enough to convict her killer? Okay, 
some murderers are compelled to leave a very personal mark on their victims. But with the help of forensic odontologists, police can use those marks to capture those who kill with a deadly smile. In this episode, some of the names have been changed. Just after midnight on August 12, 1994, police in Woodbridge, New Jersey were dispatched to a remote area just off Route 1. A battered, semi-nude woman, identified as 25-year-old Melissa Padilla, had been found murdered, lying inside a concrete pipe. Crime technicians began processing the area for clues. They collected several recently purchased grocery items scattered near the body. They also recovered a blood-stained dollar bill and nearby several cigarette butts, which investigators hoped would yield valuable DNA evidence. The victim's discarded shorts, stained with blood, were found nearby. Inside one of the pockets was a store receipt for several grocery items, time stamped 11.29 p.m. While evidence technicians continued processing the scene, Melissa's boyfriend, Hector Gonzalez, who had found her body, was brought in for questioning. He couldn't imagine anyone who would want to hurt Melissa, a dedicated mother of four. Hector said that after putting the kids to bed around 11 p.m., Melissa said she wanted to go to a nearby convenience store to pick up a few things. Hector agreed to watch the kids. She said she would be back within a half hour. When she hadn't returned more than an hour later, he became concerned and asked a friend to help look for her. That's when they found Melissa's battered body along Route 1, the path she normally took to go to the store. Hector later agreed to take a polygraph examination. Test results indicated he had nothing to do with Melissa's murder. Though police had no obvious suspects, the motive behind the murder seemed clear. Middlesex County Prosecutor's Office Lieutenant Lawrence Nagel worked the case. The woman that was found at the scene uh, was found uh, naked from the waist down. Uh, it appeared uh, there was um, severe trauma to her face area. Uh, initial impressions were that it appeared to be a, a sexual type of situation. At autopsy, the medical examiner concluded that Melissa Padilla had died of manual strangulation her face had been viciously beaten. Though it was clear she had been sexually assaulted, no biological evidence was recovered. More disturbing was the presence of small contusions on the victim's body. The ones found on Melissa's chin appeared to be bite marks. Knowing the bite marks would be crucial in linking a suspect to the crime, an identification officer with the Middlesex County Prosecutor's Office precisely photographed them to scale, using standards developed by the American Board of Forensic Odontologists. For the bite mark evidence to be useful, investigators had to identify a suspect. Trying to retrace Melissa's movements, investigators retrieved the security camera videotape from the store Melissa had been to just before her death. Melissa was clearly visible, purchasing the items found near her body. The amount of change she was seen receiving was the same amount found in her pocket. But no one who appeared in the video looked suspicious. 
analysis of the items recovered from the crime scene had little else to offer. Though DNA was found on the cigarette butts, investigators had no way to determine who had left them there or when. And all of the blood that was collected belonged to Melissa. A meticulous search for any suspect fingerprints turned up nothing. Despite the lack of clues to the killer's identity, the bite marks he left behind gave investigators a glimpse into his violent mind. Assistant Prosecutor Thomas Capsack of the Middlesex County Prosecutor's Office worked the case. The nature of the crime suggested anger. Uh, the victim was really uh, brutalized. There had to be a lot of pain involved. And we eventually concluded that the bite mark on the chin occurred while he was looking into her eyes while he was causing pain. Police began focusing their attention on sex offenders known to be living in the area. A state prison facility housing such offenders was located just a few miles from the crime scene and several inmates had recently been released. Investigators tracked each one of them down. All denied knowledge of Melissa Padilla's murder. And all were eventually cleared by polygraph examinations. Investigators scoured dozens of homicide cases looking for one with a similar M.O. But despite their efforts, eight months passed with no progress in the investigation of Melissa Padilla's murder. But in April 1995, investigators received a call from the Maine State Police. Authorities there were requesting background information on a Woodbridge, New Jersey resident, 31-year-old Stephen Fortin, who was in their custody for sexually assaulting a female Maine State Trooper. For Lieutenant Nagel, the details of the assault sounded eerily familiar. It was revealed during a conversation with the Maine State Police that the trooper during the assault by Stephen Fortin was bitten in the same immediate areas that Melissa Badillo was bitten on. Hoping this was the break they had been waiting for, investigators traveled to Maine to speak with the trooper, who was still recovering in the hospital. Investigators immediately noticed that the trooper had sustained bite marks on her chin, the same spot where Melissa Padilla had been bitten. The off-duty trooper said she saw a car parked on the side of the road, facing oncoming traffic. Open the window. Concerned, she pulled over. Having trouble with your car tonight? The driver claimed to be having mechanical problems, okay, but the trooper the noticed now. a strong alcohol smell. Okay, stay right there. Okay, don't move. Don't move. <clears throat> okay. She administered a breathalyzer right test, which confirmed that the man was intoxicated. As the trooper radioed into the station for backup, the man suddenly attacked her from behind and knocked her unconscious. When she came to, she was in the passenger seat of her patrol car. She was in a great deal of pain and suddenly realized she had been sexually assaulted while unconscious. Believing the assailant was planning to kill her, the trooper jumped out of the car. The driver continued on. The next thing she remembered was waking up in the hospital. Her assailant, Stephen Fortin, was taken into custody less than an hour later. After examining and photographing the trooper's injuries, one thing became clear. The assault on the state trooper and the murder of Melissa Padilla bore the same ritualistic signature. Ritual involves getting sexual gratification from the crime you commit. The uh, signature in our case really was the ritual, and that is the, the beating to the uh, eyes and the nose, uh, the bite mark on the chin. 
Uh, come over here and check For this investigators, out. the similar MO of the two assaults had to be more than just a coincidence. New Jersey police went to the jail in Kennebec County, Maine, to question Fortin about the Melissa Padilla homicide. Though Fortin admitted to living in Woodbridge, New Jersey at the time, he insisted he didn't know anyone named Melissa Padilla and denied any knowledge of her murder. He also denied ever being in the area along Route 1, where Melissa's body was found. But he didn't deny his involvement in the assault on the female trooper, though he claimed he had acted in self-defense. Investigators collected hair and blood samples to compare to evidence recovered from the Melissa Padilla crime scene. Though investigators finally had a strong suspect in the young woman's homicide, they were still a long way from proving that Stephen Fortin was her killer. With only bite mark evidence to work with, police in Woodbridge, New Jersey, struggled to solve the brutal murder of Melissa Padilla, a 25-year-old mother of four. After several months with no leads, police learned of a similar assault more than 300 miles away in Maine. And the suspect in that case, Stephen Fortin, had recently moved there from Woodbridge. While waiting for DNA analysis, New Jersey authorities interviewed Fortin's friends and associates. They located an ex-girlfriend who still lived in Woodbridge. She had plenty to say about Steve Fortin. She said their turbulent four-month relationship suddenly came to a violent halt after Fortin assaulted her during an argument they had while taking a walk along Route 1. She added that after their fight, Fortin returned to apologize. The girlfriend noticed cuts and scratches on Fortin's face and hands. Fortin explained that he feared she had called the police, and he fled through the woods to avoid them. She believed the incident had taken place on August 12th. Not only was that the night Melissa was murdered, but the girlfriend had put Fortin on Route 1, an area he previously claimed he had never been to. Though investigators were now convinced that Fortin was Melissa Padilla's killer, DNA analysis on the cigarette butt found near her body was inconclusive. Examiners analyzed all of the evidence found at the crime scene again, hoping something may have been overlooked but nothing was found. For identification officer Jim O'Brien, it was clear that the bite marks would be the crucial link connecting Stephen Fortin to Melissa's murder. The DNA results were inconclusive. We had no hairs or fibers from Stephen Fortin found on the victim's body, and I never developed any fingerprints on any, any of the evidence uh, that came back to anyone except the victim herself. Therefore, the photographs of the bite marks on the victim's body uh, were very, very important in terms of physical evidence and in terms of putting Stephen Fortin at this crime scene. In April 1995, Stephen Fortin was taken to the office of Dr. Brian Morin, a dentist in Waterville, Maine. To prove Fortin had made the bite marks on Melissa's body, Investigators first needed models detailing every unique feature of his teeth. First, photographs of the suspect's teeth are taken using a millimeter ruler, so examiners can accurately determine the scale of the photos for later comparisons to pictures of the victim's injuries. Then, impressions of the upper and lower teeth are taken using a substance called dental stone, a material similar to plaster. After the molds are allowed to harden, Morin then grinds them down to remove excess material, allowing examiners to clearly see the unique features of the teeth. The molds of the suspect's teeth, in addition to life-size photographs of the bite mark injuries, are all examiners need to perform the analysis. 
Dr. Tom Richardson, a forensic odontologist in Portland, Maine, explains the process. The molds of teeth are the casts. They are the lightness of the individual's teeth in size and in shape. The photos are from the individual or medium that was bitten, and they are life size as well. We take the casts, put an overlay, go up against the marks on the photo, and we either are going to have a match if the photos are good and the marks are there, or we're not going to. Using a computer program, examiners demonstrated how the casts made of Stephen Fortin's teeth lined up perfectly with the bite marks on the victim's chin. Photographs here. The spacing between Fortin's teeth, the dimensions of the arches of his bite, and the unique details of his teeth were all consistent with the injuries on both victims. Detectives now had the physical proof they needed to charge Stephen Fortin with the murder of Melissa Padilla. Police believe that Stephen Fortin chanced upon Melissa as she returned from the convenience store. Still enraged by the argument with his girlfriend, Fortin brutally beat, bit, and sexually assaulted her before finally strangling her to death. In February 2001, he was sentenced to death in New Jersey for the murder and aggravated sexual assault of Melissa Padilla. He also pled guilty to charges stemming from the beating and sexual assault on the Maine State Trooper. He received the maximum 20-year sentence. Stephen Fortin found gratification in a brutal ritual. But 3,000 miles away in Canada, in a quiet suburb of Vancouver, one killer took perverse satisfaction from taunting the detectives on his trail. Abbotsford, British Columbia, Canada, October 14, 1995. In the early morning hours, officers from the Abbotsford Police Department were dispatched to a hospital emergency room. There, they found 16-year-old Melissa Connor, still recovering from a brutal beating she sustained a few hours earlier. Melissa told investigators that she and a friend, Tracy Sawyer, were on their way to a party when a man wielding a baseball bat jumped out of the bushes and attacked them. During the struggle, Melissa was knocked unconscious. When she came to, Tracy and the assailant were nowhere in sight. Though her recollection of the attack was still a bit hazy, Melissa was certain she had never seen the man before. Investigators rushed to the scene of the assault to search for Tracy. But only one item found at the scene suggested that a struggle had taken place. A single hoop earring that belonged to the missing teenager. Inspector Rod Gale of the Abbotsford Police Department hoped a canvas of the neighborhood would yield information. There were witnesses in the area of the crime scene, but the witnesses that we uh, established there had only heard screams in the early hours of the morning, and uh, no one had actually seen anything. Okay. Investigators feared that the 16-year-old Tracy Sawyer had been abducted, or worse. And with no suspects to pursue, they knew that time was working against them. A description of the missing teenager and details of the assault were distributed to all area law enforcement agencies. A few hours later, a man fishing along the Vedder River noticed something on the riverbank. As he moved closer to get a better look, he realized he had found a human body. Officers of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police who responded to the scene found that the young female victim had been savagely beaten and raped.
police scoured the shoreline for clues that could help them identify the young woman and her killer. But they found nothing. Still, officers of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police believe this was the missing Abbotsford girl. Sergeant Kevin McLeod. The obvious connection to me, to the Abbotsford case, was the fact that Abbotsford uh, had a missing girl and we had a dead girl. And uh, this is close vicinity of the two communities. Dental records confirmed that the woman found at the Vetter River was Tracy Sawyer. The medical examiner confirmed that the young woman had been raped. He also noted massive blunt force trauma to her head. But that wasn't what killed her. The official cause of death was ruled a drowning. The only clues to the killer's identity were bite marks on the victim's torso. The impressions were carefully photographed and preserved as evidence. The photos were sent to the Bureau of Legal Dentistry Laboratory in Vancouver. There, Dr. David Sweet, a recognized expert in forensic odontology, examined the evidence. After studying the bite mark injuries, he realized there was the potential for additional evidence to be obtained. A new technique was available for recovering saliva from a bite mark, and we could even determine if DNA was available from the saliva, and then possibly match that back to the suspect when, when and if one was uh, made available. The theory behind the technique, referred to as double swabbing, is that saliva from the suspect's mouth is transferred into the bite marks left on the victim. As demonstrated here, Dr. Sweet first dampens a sterile swab with distilled water, then wipes it across the impressions, rehydrating any saliva cells in the bite marks. Then he applies a second dry swab to the wounds, which will act as a sponge and collect the rehydrated cells that contain the suspect's DNA. Dr. Sweet performed the procedure on the teeth impressions found on Tracy Sawyer. And though she had been submerged in water for some time, he was confident the double swabbing technique would yield DNA evidence. Despite the fact that the body had been in water, the saliva is sticky enough in order to remain there. And if you can use some methods to collect that evidence that's there, even in trace forms, you'll, you'll have enough to test and to uh, analyze. The procedure was successful. Minute traces of the killer's DNA was collected. But for that evidence to be useful, Investigators would now have to find a way to identify a suspect. A forensic odontologist had successfully extracted the killer's DNA from bite marks found on 16-year-old murder victim Tracy Sawyer. But for the evidence to be useful, police in Abbotsford, British Columbia, now had to identify a suspect. They turned to the victim's parents for information. The couple said that the last time they saw Tracy was shortly before the assault. She and her friend, Melissa Connor, were leaving for a party at a neighborhood friend's house. They promised not to be out too late. Tracy seemed upbeat and excited about the party. That night, nice. she looked so happy. The couple couldn't think of a single person who would want to hurt their beautiful young daughter. In addition to releasing limited details of the investigation to the media, police also set up a tip line for potential witnesses to call with information. Soon after, a call came in. The man on the other end claimed to be Tracy's killer. 
He described in detail the bite mark found on the victim's body. The only people that would know about it were the people at the autopsy, the doctors, the policemen attending the autopsy, and uh, the immediate core team of the investigation. So it had to be the individual that had intimate knowledge of the crime scene to, to know about that bite mark. Police traced the call to a nearby payphone and rushed to the scene. But no one was there. Technicians thoroughly dusted the phone for any fingerprints the suspect may have left behind. None were found. A short while later, Abbotsford police dispatchers received a 911 call. During the conversation, which was recorded by police, a man identified himself as the killer. He wanted to know if police were having trouble finding him. He said he would never be so stupid as to leave his prints at the payphone. Okay, where are you going to be? He also promised to kill again. Hello, are you there? It's not very often that a suspect starts phoning the police and threatening to attack again, threatening to do the same thing over again, and uh, basically uh, taunting uh, that you're, you're not going to be able to catch me, I'm going to do this again. Desperate to stop this killer before he struck again, police turned back to Melissa Connor, the young woman who had survived the assault that had claimed the life of her best friend. Though her memory of the events had not fully recovered, she tried to describe the assailant to a sketch artist the best she could. She remembered the man as being a tall white male, balding, but with reddish brown hair. The information was enough for police to formulate a composite sketch, which was quickly released through the media. The press dubbed him the Abbotsford Killer. A few days later, a woman came forward with information. She recognized the man in the sketch. He appeared to be the same man who had attacked her with a baseball bat several months before. When shown a photo lineup, she picked out a man named John Eller. For the first time in the murder investigation, authorities had a viable suspect. In November 1995, more than a month after Tracy Sawyer's murder, detectives arrested John Eller at his home. He vehemently denied being the Abbotsford killer. After taking impressions of the suspect's teeth, forensic odontologist Dr. David Sweet compared them to the bite marks found on Tracy Sawyer's body. But investigators would be frustrated by the results of his analysis. It became obvious very quickly that the spacing and the shapes of his teeth were much different than the teeth that would be necessary to cause this bite mark and DNA samples from the suspect did not match the DNA Dr. Sweet had extracted from the bite marks. John Eller was eventually cleared as a suspect in Tracy's murder. Soon after, the taunting phone calls from the Abbotsford killer resumed. Frustrated, authorities came up with a plan Convinced that someone somewhere knew the killer, they decided to release the recordings of the Abbotsford killer's taunting phone calls made to police. The general public were able to hear a large variety of voice characteristics of the individual that was calling us, and that was our goal. Uh, we also had that tape on a callback line at the police office, so anybody could call a designated number and just listen to the tape. They didn't have to talk to a police officer, they could just phone and listen to the tape over and over again. The plan appeared to be a success. A woman who listened to the recordings came forward. She recognized the voice. Detectives played the tape for her again. She told them it sounded like a man named Terry Driver. She knew the voice, she said, 
because Terry Driver was her son. And she knew that he owned a police scanner and listened to it often at his home. Detectives quickly began checking Driver's background. Though he had no criminal record, the 32-year-old printer lived with his wife and two kids in the same neighborhood where the taunting phone calls had originated. Terry Driver was brought in for questioning. Though Driver adamantly denied being the Abbotsford killer, detectives collected hair and saliva for DNA analysis. Photographs and wax casts of Driver's teeth were also taken. At the Bureau of Legal Dentistry in Vancouver, Dr. Sweet looked for similarities between Driver's dental evidence and bite marks found on Tracy Sawyer's body. I produced a clear overlay with the biting edges of his teeth recorded on it at, at life size and then compared that to the photographs that were enlarged to life size also. Dr. Sweet identified several unique characteristics in the suspect's bite that convinced him that Terry Driver's teeth were consistent with the bite marks on Tracy Sawyer's body. He had some chipped teeth as well as some crowding or rotations of teeth so that they were out of position and not where you would normally find them. This made his teeth unique from everybody else's and those features were recorded in the bite mark also. But the irrefutable proof came from the DNA analysis. Terry Driver's DNA profile matched the profile of the DNA Dr. Sweet had extracted from the bite mark injuries. Dr. Sweet's double swabbing technique helped police clinch their case against a sadistic killer. Terry Driver was arrested and charged with the murder of 16-year-old Tracy Sawyer and the attempted murder of her friend, Melissa Connor. Based on the evidence, Abbotsford police believe Terry Driver was a sick predator driven by an insatiable need for attention. On October 14, 1995, that craving exploded into violence. As Melissa Connor and Tracy Sawyer made their way to a nearby party, Driver attacked them without warning. After viciously raping and killing Tracy, Driver set out to taunt police and to prove that he was invincible. In October of 1997, Terry Driver was convicted of the sexual assault slaying of Tracy Sawyer and sentenced to life in prison. He received an additional 10 years for the attempted murder of Melissa Connor. Terry Driver was compelled to call attention to his crimes. But in Indiana, another murderer went to great lengths to conceal his guilt. On October 6, 1990, at 11.37 p.m., firefighters in Shelbyville, Indiana, responded to a blaze at a nearby apartment complex. The fire was coming from the bedroom of 42-year-old Shirley Sturgill, a tenant who lived on the second floor. After extinguishing the fire on the bed, one of the firefighters made a grisly discovery. The badly burned body of a woman. And the strong smell of lighter fluid led rescue workers to conclude that this fire was no accident. After extinguishing a blaze in an apartment in Shelbyville, Indiana, firefighters had uncovered the badly burned remains of a woman lying in a bed. And according to Chief Kurt Etherton of the Shelbyville Police Department, all indications suggested she had been the victim of a homicide. It appeared a fire had been started either on or around the bed. There was a, uh, an inverted V pattern 
uh, which is consistent with a fire where uh, accelerants had been used. So uh, it was our opinion that the fire had, be, had been set at that point. After confirming that the victim was the tenant, 42-year-old Shirley Sturgill, evidence technicians began searching for clues to tell them who had started the deadly blaze and why. Several latent prints were located and preserved as evidence. But later analysis revealed they all belonged to the victim. Investigators also collected two different brands of cigarette butts. DNA analysis later revealed the presence of two distinct DNA profiles, and neither matched the victim. It appeared Shirley Sturgill's killer, or killers, had unsuccessfully tried to burn away any trace of evidence from the crime scene. At autopsy, the medical examiner determined that Shirley had not died as a result of the fire. She had been strangled to death. She had also been sexually assaulted. But the biological evidence recovered was too degraded for a thorough analysis. And there was more. Several marks were found on the victim's torso, stomach, and thigh. The ME concluded they were bite marks made from human teeth. For investigators, they were the strongest link to Shirley's killer. That person told us that if we had a suspect, that they could take impressions and he would be able to uh, determine whether or not those uh, bite marks were made by a particular person because there were some distinctive uh, markings uh, on the bites that would be consistent with uh, someone's teeth not being aligned straight. What time was it when Detectives you began their hunt for Shirley Sturgill's killer by speaking with her daughter. Angie Carr said she and her mother were very close. She couldn't think of anyone who would want to hurt her. She described her mother as a kind, sensitive, and selfless woman who dedicated her life to Angie's happiness and well-being. She was also a wonderful grandmother to Angie's young children. Angie had spoken to her mother on the phone just an hour or so before firefighters were called to the apartment. There didn't seem to be anything troubling her mother. The victim did mention during the conversation that her next door neighbor, Jerry Donaldson, was there visiting at the time. It was a name already familiar to detectives. Arson investigators who had responded to Shirley's apartment the night of the murder said a neighbor was asking a lot of questions and seemed to know specific details of the crime itself. His name was Jerry Donaldson. They said that the neighbor was telling uh, you know, several things about the crime that uh, he felt no one else would, would probably know. So when did you last... Uh, Donaldson was brought in for questioning. He admitted visiting Shirley the night she died. She had hurt her back recently, and he checked in on her periodically to see if she needed anything. He said they watched TV, and about 10.30, after smoking a cigarette, he went home. When asked how he knew so much about the murder, Donaldson claimed he'd overheard the firefighters talking. He agreed to provide hair samples for a DNA analysis. Donaldson's DNA was consistent with DNA recovered from one of the cigarette butts found in the victim's apartment. And though he had never denied being there, Investigators were convinced he knew more about the murder than he claimed. On October 24th, nearly three weeks after Shirley Sturgill's murder, police arrested Jerry Donaldson on suspicion of murder. They also obtained a court order requiring impressions of his teeth to be made. A forensic odontologist overlaid impressions of the suspect's teeth 
over photographs of Shirley Sturgill's bite mark injuries. Though they didn't line up perfectly, the examiner felt that the two were consistent. But the suspect's lawyer saw to it that Donaldson would never stand trial for murder. The defense team hired, I think, two different odontologists from uh, other parts of the country who had differing opinions uh, than the odontologists we used. The prosecutor and his staff sat down with the defense team and went over the discrepancies which eventually led to the release of the suspect. For Shelbyville detectives, the setback was frustrating. The investigation into Shirley Sturgill's savage murder had ground to a halt. Investigators were back to square one and with no obvious suspects to pursue. Shelbyville, Indiana police struggled to solve the brutal homicide of 42-year-old Shirley Sturgill. Though teeth marks had been found on the victim's body, investigators had no other clues to the killer's identity. A year after the homicide, the case was turned over to Captain Bill Dwenger. One of the things that, that struck me as odd, it was the uh, amount of anger or rage that was built up inside someone that could inflict these type of injuries on another human being. After re-examining dozens of witness statements taken over the previous year, Dwenger noticed that several people had commented that Shirley and her son-in-law had not gotten along. Though that didn't seem so unusual, investigators decided to talk with Shirley's daughter, Angie, again, and to her husband, John Del Carr. Could I just get a copy of the Mr. Carr? We're investigating the... John Del Carr was up front about his feelings for his mother-in-law. He didn't like her, and they argued often. Mostly about Shirley's constant interfering with his marriage. He said that on the night of the murder, he was with an old army buddy who was visiting from out of town. He hadn't seen Shirley that day. Angie corroborated her husband's alibi. Though John Del Carr was still considered a suspect, police had no evidence against him. Okay, I think you need to get on that. But a month later, Detectives learned that John Del Carr had been arrested for murdering a young woman in nearby Hamilton County, Indiana. Though no bite marks were left on this victim, she had been sexually assaulted and strangled to death. The same M.O. as the murder of Shirley Sturgill. Shelbyville detectives drove to the state prison to speak with John Del Carr and obtain potential evidence. But the suspect was uncooperative and refused to answer any questions. Investigators ultimately collected hair and blood samples for DNA comparisons with evidence recovered from Shirley's apartment. At the crime lab, examiners concluded that John Del Carr's DNA was consistent with DNA from one of the cigarette butts found in Shirley's bedroom. John Del Carr had been at the victim's apartment, something he previously denied. Though it was strong circumstantial evidence, it didn't prove that he was the killer. There was only one way investigators could make their case. They needed impressions of John Del Carr's teeth to compare to the bite marks found on Shirley Sturgill's body. But so far, they lacked probable cause to obtain a warrant to force the suspect to provide the samples. And they knew that without that evidence, it would be difficult to get a conviction. Thanks. Thank you. We needed to know, and the jury's going to need to know, did we get his dental impressions? Did they match up to the bite marks on the body of Shirley Sturgill? Without that, I'm not sure a jury would be able to find him guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. So we needed that information, whether it was going to be, yes, they, they do match up, or no, they do not. On August 3rd, 1994, almost four years after the murder, 
investigators finally got a break. Angie Carr had since divorced her husband, and now that he was in prison, she wanted to talk. She believed John Del Carr had in fact murdered her mother. She admitted to having lied to police before, but out of fear for her safety and the safety of her children. According to Angie, John came home very late the night of the murder. Suddenly, he grabbed a shotgun, pointed it at her, and told her he had hurt her mother. He dragged her to the room where her children were sleeping and threatened to kill her and them if she ever said anything. Angie told police that John kept up his threats in the following month. The kids' room. Besides hurting your And she believed he wouldn't hesitate to carry them out. Put a shotgun to their heads and threatened to kill them too. John Carr's wife, I believe, was genuinely terrified of John. She knew what he was capable of. I think she did what she had to do to protect herself and her children. It was the break detectives had been waiting for. Angie's testimony was enough for investigators to obtain a court order to force John Del Carr to give teeth impressions. Investigators contacted forensic odontologist Dr. John Kenny, the deputy coroner for DuPage County, Illinois. I was asked to go to the state prison and to uh, meet with Mr. Carr in the uh, uh, dental infirmary and to take his impressions and any other records as I would need to make a bite mark comparison. Okay. But John Del Carr still refused to cooperate. Okay. Investigators received another court order, this time giving them the authority to anesthetize the suspect in order to obtain the evidence. It was possible in this particular case to, because of the configuration of Mr. Carr's teeth, uh, several of his teeth were misaligned and crowded, particularly on the upper arch, to take the model of his teeth and fit it right to the injury uh, in one of these positive replicas. All of the unique characteristics of John Del Carr's teeth matched the injuries present on Shirley Sturgill's body. There was no doubt that his teeth had left the wounds. Police believe that on October 6, 1990, John Del Carr, resentful of his mother-in-law's interference in his marriage, drove to her apartment and confronted her. His anger exploded into violence. Carr beat, bit, and sexually assaulted Shirley Sturgill before strangling her to death. After, he set her apartment on fire, hoping all traces of his crime would burn away. In April 1997, John Del Carr was convicted of the first-degree murder of his mother-in-law, Shirley Sturgill. He was sentenced to 60 years in prison. Some killers are driven to leave a very personal mark on their victims. When police have little other evidence to work with, they turn to forensic odontologists who seize upon those marks to take the bite out of a killer's deadly smile. In Wisconsin, dismembered human remains are found along a river's edge. To solve this murder, investigators must first find a way to identify the victim. The body of a decomposed man is found in an Arizona state park. Only advanced computer technology can lead detectives to his killer. After finding skeletal remains, Texas police arrest a suspect in the murder. But unless the victim can be quickly identified, detectives will be forced to set a killer free. Some killers believe that by concealing the identity of their victims, their crimes will go unpunished. But with advanced technology, Forensic artists are identifying faceless victims and exposing a killer's guilt by drawing conclusions.
In this episode, some of the names have been changed. Outside the city limits of Madison, the serene landscape of Sauk County, Wisconsin is a popular destination for people looking to enjoy the outdoors. Around 4 p.m. on July 30th, 1999, a woman and her son were hiking a trail along the shores of the Wisconsin River. The young boy noticed a plastic grocery bag at the water's edge. A closer look revealed the skeletal remains of a human hand. The mother quickly summoned police. Officers from the Sauk County Sheriff's Department responded to the scene. The hand was still attached to the arm, which had been precisely severed at the shoulder joint. Unsure what to make of the finding, police decided to spread out and search the area. Scattered along the shoreline, they discovered several trash bags. Inside were more human remains. Detectives recovered the head and torso of what appeared to be an African-American woman. Her face and scalp had been sliced from the skull. All of the unidentified remains were collected and sent on for a more detailed analysis. For Detective Joe Welch of the Sauk County Sheriff's Department, the measures taken by the killer to conceal the victim's identity were telling. The skin had been removed and placed in a separate garbage bag. It appeared that it was removed in a, a skillful fashion, that the person that was doing it knew what they were doing. To find the killer, investigators knew they would first have to identify the victim. By studying the remains, the medical examiner concluded that the woman was five feet one to five feet three inches tall and was likely between the ages of 18 and 25. The level of decomposition suggested she had been dead for at least five days. Examiners were able to obtain fingerprints from the victim's hands. Hoping the prints were on file, investigators ran them through the FBI's National Fingerprint Database. But there were no matches. Sauk County Sheriff Randy Stamen would have to find another way to give this victim a name. We initially thought that we'd be able to generate fingerprints and make a comparison and identify the body of the victim, feeling that if we could make that identification, we'd have a very good chance of solving the crime. When that failed, then the next step, obviously, was to put out a physical description and a photograph. The problem we had there was that we didn't have a face on our victim. The flesh that remained on the victim's skull held the only clues to the woman's identity. And investigators knew that sending the severed head to a forensic artist for a facial reconstruction would destroy that evidence. But scientists at the Milwaukee School of Engineering believed they could help. They requested a CAT scan of the woman's head. Engineers believed that by using the CAT scan, they could possibly create an exact three-dimensional paper replica of the skull, which could then be used by a forensic artist to reconstruct the victim's likeness. And no evidence would be destroyed in the process. Engineering professor, Dr. Lisa Milkowski. In this case, we're trying to produce a replica that looks like and is very similar to an actual skull. And the paper layers look like, feel like an actual skull. First, engineers had to convert the data from the CAT scan into a computerized three-dimensional model. The resulting information was then transferred onto a disk. Next, the data was subjected to a process called rapid prototyping. 
Normally, rapid prototyping technology is used to test engineering designs that have been created on the computer. The process converts the computer model into an actual three-dimensional replica made of laminated paper, allowing engineers to analyze it for design flaws. The process had never been used in a forensic setting. First, the three-dimensional model of the skull was broken down into flat two-dimensional layers. Then, carbon dioxide lasers began precisely tracing each layer onto a sheet of paper. Each unique cutout is then layered on top of each other, fused together with glue. The layering process that is used when constructing an object with rapid prototyping is similar to thinking about slices in a loaf of bread. The entire loaf is three-dimensional in nature, but each slice is flat. The same thing is done when we construct an object with paper layers. We start out with, with a single paper layer, just like a sheet of paper, and the laser traces out the shape on that single layer. And as all these layers are stacked together, each one having a unique cutout, we come up with this uh, three-dimensional object. The resulting block of paper is whittled down until the replica is all that remains. Forty hours later, nearly 10,000 sheets of laminated paper had gone into creating an exact paper reproduction of the victim's skull. Investigators decided to send the replica several hundred miles away to the Kentucky State Crime Lab. There, Dr. Emily Craig, a renowned forensic anthropologist and a leader in facial reconstruction, was asked to put a face on the paper skull. The possibility of doing a clay reconstruction on a prototype skull was actually kind of exciting. To my knowledge, I don't think anyone in this country had done it for victim identification. To bring this victim to life, Dr. Craig attached tissue depth markers to several different points on the skull. These markers reflect the average thickness of skin for people of similar race, age, and sex. Before molding the facial features, however, Dr. Craig has to be certain that the eyes selected will be of the same size and shape as those of individuals similar to the victim. Guided by the spatial arrangements of the victim's skull, the eyes are precisely set into place. In order to generate recognition from the public, the spacing and the gaze of the eyes has to be perfect. Once completed, Dr. Craig began bringing Jane Doe to life by modeling her face using an oil-based clay. The fine detail as to the lids and the nose and the lips, that's basically where the artistic skills supersede or complement the scientific data. You really need both to do a good facial reconstruction. After dozens of hours, the face of the murder victim began to take shape. Variations of the victim's appearance were photographed and the clay model was sent to police in Sauk County. Investigators quickly released the photographs through the media. Still, weeks passed without a lead. But then, a woman named Sherry contacted police. She said the face in the poster bore an uncanny resemblance to a 25-year-old woman named Muvano Kupaza. Right, here it is. Muvano, she said, had come to the United States from Tanzania to study English. What do you think? Muvano was a relative of Sherry's ex-husband, Peter Kupaza, who was also from Tanzania. 
Though the three lived together for some time, Muvano began having problems at the couple's residence. Sherry learned that while the three were living together, Peter had become abusive towards his cousin. Late at night, while Sherry was asleep, he would sneak into Muvano's room. There, he raped the 25-year-old exchange student repeatedly, threatening to kill her if she ever told anyone. She told police that when Muvano told her what was going on, Sherry left her husband. A few weeks later, Muvano decided to return home. Police now believe that the young woman never made it back to Tanzania. Looking to verify that Muvano was the murder victim, detectives went door to door throughout the neighborhood. Neighbors agreed that the reconstructed face resembled Muvano Kupaza. Police questioned her 40-year-old cousin, Peter. He denied any knowledge of the murder. And he viewed photographs of the victim's reconstructed face with a total lack of recognition. I showed him a poster. I asked him if that looked like anyone he knew. He said it didn't look like anyone he knew at all. Though Peter claimed he had no pictures of his cousin, he agreed to turn over two photo albums. He added that he had recently spoken to Muvano's father in Tanzania. He was told that his cousin had made it home and was doing fine. Looking to verify the story, investigators contacted Muvano's family in Tanzania. According to her father, Muvano had never returned home and he hadn't heard from her in some time. Peter Kupaza had been caught in a lie. Detectives began digging into his background. Kupaza, they learned, had worked for several years as a butcher. Though that did not prove murder, it went a long way in explaining the precision in which the victim's remains had been severed. Believing the dismembered victim found at the Wisconsin River was Muvano Kupaza, investigators shifted their focus to building a murder case against her cousin, Peter. With the help of forensic anthropologist Dr. Emily Craig, investigators in Sauk County, Wisconsin, believed they had finally identified dismembered human remains as belonging to 25-year-old Tanzanian native Muvano Kupaza. And statements made by the young woman's relatives led police to believe that her cousin, 40-year-old Peter Kapaza, was behind the brutal murder and dismemberment. Before they could prove murder, however, police needed irrefutable proof that the victim found at the Wisconsin River was Muvano Kupaza. They tracked down her local doctor. Police collected the young woman's medical records, hopeful they contained the information needed to make a positive identification. They were in luck. We were able to get some forms that she had filled out, and she had actually, she touched to, to fill these forms out. We took these forms to the Wisconsin State Crime Laboratory, where they did processing and actually were able to locate latent fingerprints on those forms and compared them to our deceased and found that uh, this was our deceased and she was identified as Muvano Kupaza. To make their case against Peter, police contacted his ex-wife Sherry the following day. Though the suspect denied having any photos of Muvano, Sherry discovered three pictures of her in her ex-husband's photo album. and they bore a striking similarity to Emily Craig's facial reconstruction. With a search warrant in hand, police and forensic technicians returned to Peter Kupaza's residence. Now they were looking to uncover physical proof of murder. In the bathroom, they believed they found it. Yeah. 
On a section of the baseboard, they observed reddish-brown stains that appeared to be blood. The section was removed for future DNA testing. Investigators turned to forensic examiners for proof that Peter Kupaza had murdered his cousin. Examiners generated a genetic profile of the blood found in Kupaza's bathroom. When that was compared to the DNA recovered from the victim's flesh, they found an identical match. Peter Kupaza was arrested and charged with murder. Based on the evidence, investigators believe that Muvano began threatening to expose her cousin's sexual abuse. And Peter Kupaza would do anything to keep that from happening. After killing her, police believe he dragged the young woman's body into the bathroom, where he dismembered her. Then he tried to dispose of the remains by dumping them in the Wisconsin River. On June 22, 2000, Peter Kupaza was sentenced to life in prison for the first-degree murder of his cousin, Muvano. In Wisconsin, the willingness to adapt a high-tech engineering process to crime-solving led to the conviction of a brutal killer. To solve a murder in Phoenix, Arizona, police must rely on computer software to help them identify the victim. North of the city of Phoenix, on the evening of February 17, 1996, a hunter walking along a trail in the Tonto National Forest noticed something lying just inside the tree line. He approached the object, believing it to be an injured animal. But what he found was a lifeless human body. The man fled the scene and called 911. Deputies from the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office were dispatched to the scene. The victim, determined to be a white male, had suffered a single gunshot wound to the back of the head. But with no form of identification located, police were unable to determine who he was or why he had been murdered. And the level of decomposition had made it difficult to discern any identifiable facial features. The only clues to this victim's identity were a cowboy hat with a bullet hole just above the brim and a pair of prescription glasses. The following day, Maricopa County investigators were no closer to identifying the victim. But for Sergeant Keith Moore, mud stains found on the victim's clothes provided a clue as to when the murder had occurred. Well, earlier in that week, we had experienced rain in the area. There were some indications from the mud on the clothing that the, the body was there uh, before the rain because of the, the mud that was splashed up on the clothing on the pants legs. The medical examiner determined that the victim had been dead at least 10 days. Cause of death was a large caliber gunshot wound to the man's head fired at close range. He was determined to be between the ages of 45 and 55, standing about six feet tall. But other than fingerprints, no identifying features remained. Decomposition had left his face unrecognizable. Until police could positively identify this victim, finding his killer would be nearly impossible. Police in Maricopa County, Arizona, continued trying to identify the decomposed body of a middle-aged white male who was found shot to death in the Tonto National Forest. Detectives began scouring recently filed missing persons reports, hoping to find one that matched their victim. But none were found. And the victim's fingerprints, which were recovered at autopsy, 
did not exist on any law enforcement database. Homicide detective Barry Lynch worked the case. Once we ran through our normal operating procedures, uh, investigating procedures, fingerprints, uh, the autopsy, uh, everything that we possibly could do, uh, we, we came to the conclusion that, that we had exhausted all our normal investigative uh, tools that we have at our disposal, and we were going to have to go someplace else and, and, and look into doing something different to try and make this case or try and identify this individual. Detectives turned to examiners at the nearby Glendale Police Department. There, forensic artist John Wintrow was assigned the case. By applying specially designed computer software to photographs of a victim's face, Wintrow has become an expert in erasing the effects of trauma and decomposition. Having a clear image of the victim's likeness makes it more likely that someone will recognize the face. In this case, it's a matter of using these tools to eliminate and clean up the original photograph, the original picture being scanned, to get rid of the decomposition, to get rid of the trauma, and take that image, which is once graphic, and turn it into a presentable image for the media so that it can assist in the identification of this person. Before beginning the reconstruction in this case, however, Wintrow had to first photograph the face of the victim found in the Tonto National Forest. When you're taking photographs of the victim's face, ideally what you would like to have is what's referred to as a Frankfurt plane, which is just a, almost a portrait-like, eyes front, even uh, keeled facial shot. In doing so, in the process, you have to keep in consideration that you're going to be scanning this photograph in. Wintrow next photographed the cowboy hat and prescription glasses that were recovered from the crime scene careful to use the same scale as the photographs of the victim's face. Taking a Polaroid at arm's length away gives me a, a form of measurement so that when I'm taking photographs of glasses and cowboy hats and other items that are going to be scanned in on the photograph, I have a distance of measurement. Investigators hope that by layering such details onto the reconstructed face, it would become more likely that someone would recognize the victim. After scanning all of the photos into the computer, Wintrow was ready to begin the reconstruction. His first step was to use the computer software to eliminate the trauma and decomposition present on the victim's face. Taking those graphic images away starts off with finding a good piece of tissue, a good piece of, of, of skin that is not decomposed. And by taking uh, a tool referred to as clone pipe in this program, I can take this large circle which is placed over the tissue that is not decomposed or not uh, exhibiting trauma, and then taking the small uh, circle and cloning the good tissue over the bad tissue, or skin in this case. Then, using a smoothing tool, Wintrow blended all of the skin tones together until no traces of damaged tissue remained. In the final step of the process, the victim's prescription glasses and cowboy hat were layered onto the image. Finally, a week after the unidentified victim was found murdered, the forensic artist had given him a face. Maricopa County detectives quickly released the victim's image to the media. Within a few hours, John Wintrow's efforts paid off. A local resident, John Christian, recognized the victim as being 52-year-old Thomas Donahue. Now, I know, I know Sue works at the, at the grocery store. He hadn't seen or heard from Tom in some time. See if I could find anything, if I heard anything about this girl. He described his friend as a simple but nice man who was always eager to gain the acceptance of people around him. John Christian told police that Tom, who was employed as a security guard for a local company, lived with a woman named Darlene Schlicht. Though Darlene and her friends were rumored to be involved in criminal activity, including forgery and check fraud scams, Tom tried to fit in with the group. 
Christian had heard that one of those friends, Carrie Scott, seemed to resent Tom's efforts to include himself in their activities. I think it's 23rd. Christian hadn't seen Darlene or any of her friends in some time. Her, her Aunt Sue works at... Looking to prove that the victim was in fact Thomas Donahue, detectives contacted his employer. Got some information about the case? Tom, they said, had not shown up for work in several weeks. Donahue's fingerprints were on file, and his employers agreed to forward them to the crime lab. Examiners compared the known prints of Thomas Donahue to those recovered from the victim. They matched. Thomas Donahue was officially the victim of a homicide. Now, looking to identify his killer, investigators began tracking down his roommate, Darlene Schlick, for information. But she was nowhere to be found. A records check soon explained why. Three days after Thomas Donahue's body was found, Darlene Schlick had been arrested on forgery charges in nearby Tempe, Arizona. According to the reports, Darlene had tried to pass a check at a cafe using an account that had been closed for several months. It turns out the account was in the name of Thomas Donahue. After being turned over to police, Darlene was placed under arrest and transported to the Tempe jail. Though the finding was incriminating, it didn't prove that Darlene had committed murder. Police hoped that Carrie Scott, Darlene's alleged accomplice in the forgery scams, would have information about the homicide. But she was difficult to track down. A short while later, investigators got a tip that Carrie Scott was staying at a nearby motel. The woman who answered the door told police that Carrie wasn't there. But they didn't believe her. Police began searching the room. In the bathroom, they found Carrie hiding in the shower. She was placed under arrest on unrelated outstanding warrants. At the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office, investigators questioned Carrie about Darlene's role in the murder of Thomas Donahue. At first, she was uncooperative. But after some time, Carrie decided to talk. She admitted to being present at the time of the killing, and she confirmed that Darlene Schlick had committed the murder. According to Carrie, one night a few weeks back, she, Darlene, and another friend went out for a drive to the Tonto National Forest with Tom. As they made their way to a hiking trail, Darlene grabbed a handgun that Tom had brought along, ran up behind him, and shot him in the back of the head. Though Carrie Scott claimed she had no idea that Darlene was planning to kill Tom, the murder didn't surprise her. Darlene had recently told her that Tom knew too much about their forgery scams and she wanted to do away with him. After hearing the version of the incident from Carrie Scott then, uh, we had to find other individuals and other suspects who were involved in the case to be able to confirm or deny her version of the story. Police tracked down the third woman said to be present when the murder occurred. At first, Erica Land denied any knowledge of the killing. But when she learned Carrie Scott had told police she was there, Erica broke down. But she had a different story to tell. According to Erica, it was Carrie Scott and not Darlene Schlicht who had pulled the trigger. 
loading it and everything. Okay, you were actually holding the gun. Erica oh. said she had not been included in the planning of the murder. In exchange for her testimony, investigators agreed not to arrest her. Unsure what to make of the conflicting stories, detectives traveled to the Tempe jail to interview Darlene Schlicht. Like Erica Land, Darlene blamed the murder on Carrie Scott. Darlene admitted that she had helped plan the murder. They decided that Mr. Donahue wants to involve himself in our criminal activity. And out of a conversation that they had at Darlene's apartment, they conspired to go ahead and take him to some remote area in the county and kill Mr. Donahue. Didn't they tell you? Though police had no physical evidence to corroborate the testimony, they were now convinced that Carrie Scott's version of events was a lie. Carrie Scott. Uh, spent a good deal of her time trying to figure ways to isolate herself or remove herself from her involvement in this particular case. Uh, so there was a, a stark contrast between the two. And having interviewed the other principals involved in the case uh, and some of the other witnesses, uh, they all tend to corroborate what Ms. Slitz had, Darlene Slitz had stated. Police believe that Thomas Donahue tried to get involved in the group's criminal activity but Carrie Scott and Darlene Schlicht didn't trust him, and they decided to kill him. On February 7, 1996, they lured him to an isolated spot at the Tonto National Forest. As he walked along a trail, Carrie Scott approached him from behind and shot him once in the head. They believed that a prolonged exposure to the elements would keep his identity and their crime a mystery. Carrie Scott stood trial for the first-degree murder of Thomas Donahue. She was convicted and sentenced to life in prison. Darlene Schlicht was also tried and sentenced to life in prison. The composite that uh, Mr. Wintrow provided to us was uh, crucial in this case because it was the means by which someone was able to identify Mr. Donahue. Without that, we would have probably never found the identity of Mr. Donahue or the principal players involved in this case. With the aid of computer software, forensic artist John Wintrow was able to restore a victim's appearance and help bring two killers to justice. In Texas, police must rely on a renowned forensic artist to identify a faceless victim. In the late afternoon hours of July 18, 1989, a young boy playing near a lake in Wills Point, Texas, stumbled upon some debris that had washed ashore. Curious as to what he had found, he began poking at the trash. When it flipped over, he saw that it was a human skull wrapped in cloth. Frightened, the boy ran to tell his father. After receiving the 911 call, deputies from the Van Zant County Sheriff's Office were dispatched to Willow Lake. There, they located the human skull and a pair of blue denim shorts scattered on the ground. Rope had been used to bind the items. Police carefully collected the remains and a few stray red hairs lying nearby. Having found no other clues to the victim's identity, investigators forwarded what little evidence they had recovered to forensic examiners. From the level of decay, examiners determined that the remains had been lying outdoors for at least a year and evidence of blunt force trauma found on the skull suggested the victim had been murdered. Further analysis led to the conclusion that the victim was a Caucasian female, but little else was learned. 
Captain Rock Ellis of the Van Zandt County Sheriff's Office was contacted with the autopsy results. It was clear this would be a difficult case to solve. Forensics is telling me, you know, that the lady is uh, somewhere between uh, 20 and 40 years old. Uh, she had red hair. Um, and that's about all we had to go on at that time. As investigators struggled to identify the victim, dispatchers received a 911 call. More human remains had been found. Because of the decreased water level at Willow Lake, a passerby had stumbled upon a partial skeleton lying in the mud. It was found less than 200 feet away from where the skull had been found. Chicken wire surrounded the remains. The caging had been tied to concrete blocks with electrical wire and rope, likely used to keep the remains submerged in the lake. And there was something else. It appeared the ropes had been tied with the same type of knots as those found with the skull. Forensic analysis later confirmed that these remains were at one time attached to the skull found a week earlier. Though the findings had provided investigators with additional evidence of murder, the identity of this victim and her killer remained a mystery. Police in Van Zandt County, Texas, struggled to identify female skeletal remains found scattered along the shores of Willow Lake. As police began canvassing the nearby neighborhood, they made a startling discovery in one of the yards. Lying next to a roll of chicken wire, police noticed some ropes. They were the same type and tied with the same knots as those found with the skeletal remains. The same knots were tied on all three places. A clove hitch is not unique, a bowline is not unique, but when you see those knots tied with the same type material in three different places, it focuses in on the same person tying the knots. Though no one was home, police obtained a warrant and collected the evidence. Now they needed to find out who lived at that residence. A property search revealed that the house belonged to an elderly couple who lived there with their 38-year-old son, Ronald Mark Holloway. And a records check indicated that Holloway was currently on parole for the sexual assault and attempted murder of a woman in another state. I contacted the officer that worked the case and uh, during our conversations he gave me a lot of insight into Holloway and he also read me part of a statement that Holloway made in which he said that if he did this again he would uh, cut the person up and put him in the water. Though investigators had few clues to the identity of the woman found at the lake, they believed they had a suspect in her murder. Less than two months later, the elusive suspect, Ronald Holloway, was finally located in a nearby county and brought in for questioning. He admitted that he had tied the knots on the rope found at his parents' home. But he denied any knowledge of the murder. Detectives sensed that he was lying. Though their case was circumstantial, they decided to place Ronald Holloway under arrest for suspicion of murder. I was afraid that if I didn't make my move then, that uh, he would be a long time before I saw him again. So I figured I'd get him while I could. But with Holloway's arrest, investigators found a new challenge. Because of a Texas law, they had only a short period of time in which to formally charge the suspect with murder. Sergeant Steve Black of the Texas Rangers was asked to assist in the investigation. In Texas at that time, we had what they call a speedy trial act. And if you, if, if you didn't bring your defendant uh, 
to trial within that time where you, you know, you were in, in, in serious trouble, the defendant would be gone. Having only 60 days to make their case, investigators turned to renowned forensic artist Karen Taylor for help. With only a skull to work with, Taylor combined science and art in order to accurately reconstruct the features and fine details that make each face unique. The advantage in putting a face on a skull is that arrangement is given there in the skull. The openings exist already. The various orifices of the skull are there and the features have to be placed over them and so the proportions are built in. It's the spatial arrangement of those features that has proven in study after study to be critical for triggering recognition. Taylor begins by photographing the skull with 21 tissue depth markers placed at precise points. Tracing paper is then laid over the life-size photographs of the skull. Using the rubber markers as her guide, Taylor began shaping the contours of this victim's face. Once complete, the next step is to draw in the eyes, nose, mouth, and other features that will potentially lead to the identity of the victim. There are certain ways to calculate the individual features. There's a formula for each feature, for the development of the eye and determination of the width of the nose or the projection of the nose or the, the width of the mouth and so forth. Using established scientific data to approximate the size and shape of the victim's features, Taylor next looked to other evidence recovered from the crime scene to help her fine tune her drawing. A pair of blue jean shorts were recovered that were size 26 inch waist, indicating a really uh, slender individual. So I knew that I needed to slenderize the face somewhat, so I actually uh, shaded in the cheek area to make uh, the finished reconstruction drawing look more slender. Karen Taylor had taken a faceless skull and created the image of a young woman, hopeful it would lead to her name and the name of her killer. The forensic artist has the ability to, to develop a face that uh, gives that individual who's a victim of violent crime one last opportunity to be identified. And, and uh, that's the reason we, we do what we do. Hoping this would generate the lead they needed to link Ronald Holloway to the murder victim, investigators quickly released the sketch through the media. Within a few hours, they got a tip. A caller recognized the sketch as resembling 28-year-old Jennifer D. Weiniger, who shared a house with her boyfriend in nearby Elmo, Texas. Police went to the address. Ray Dawson agreed that the sketch he had seen in the paper looked like his girlfriend. Police asked him for a photograph of Jennifer. Yeah, pretty happy. The picture of the girl was a dead ringer of the, the uh, artist rendering that Karen had fixed for us. We've been together for the past two years. Around the time Jennifer disappeared, Dawson said he was in jail on traffic violations. And though he hadn't heard from her since, he didn't think much of it. In the past, Jennifer would ask him to drive her to the local bus station. She was a free spirit and enjoyed being out on the road. In fact, she would often take off on hitchhiking trips across the country and be gone for months at a time. Police specifically asked him about Jennifer's friends and associates. But Dawson didn't know anyone named Ronald Holloway. Believing they had finally identified their homicide victim, authorities retrieved Jennifer Weiniger's dental records and compared them to the remains found at the lake. It was a perfect match. Though Karen Taylor's facial reconstruction had led to a positive identification of the remains found at Willow Lake, investigators were no closer to proving Ronald Holloway was the killer. And under Texas law, 
police only had a few days left before they would have to release the suspect. Unless they could find a way to connect him directly to the victim, Holloway might just get away with murder. With the help of forensic artist Karen Taylor, authorities in Van Zandt County, Texas, had finally identified skeletal remains as 28-year-old murder victim Jennifer Weiniger. Though authorities had established a physical link between evidence found at the crime scenes and the home of Ronald Holloway, they struggled to tie the suspect directly to the victim. And they had only a few more days to prove he was the killer. Otherwise, they would be forced by Texas law to set him free. Hoping to uncover a connection between the suspect and the victim, police began canvassing Jennifer's Elmo, Texas neighborhood. A clerk at a local convenience store knew Jennifer well. She used to come into the store several times a week. And there was more. Captain Rock Ellis. About the time that she disappeared, he told me that Jennifer was at the store. Holloway pulled in, and he was pretty well known because he had at that time a pretty flashy red truck, and that he talked to her outside the store that evening about 10 o'clock, and that she got in the truck, and uh, they left together. I tried very hard to find anyone who had seen her after that night and couldn't. Under questioning, Ronald Holloway insisted he didn't know anyone named Jennifer Weiniger. Police knew that was a lie. Though all the evidence against him was circumstantial, investigators felt they had enough to finally win a murder conviction. Police believe that in August of 1988, the rage Holloway had asserted towards women in the past resurfaced soon after he and Jennifer began a relationship. Using a blunt object, he beat Jennifer Weininger to death and then disposed of her remains in Willow Lake. On January 30th, 1990, Ronald Mark Holloway was convicted of the murder of Jennifer D. Weininger. He received a sentence of 25 years to life in prison. When solving a murder, homicide investigators rely on the victim's identity to lead them to a suspect. But to give a faceless victim a name, police turn to forensic artists who can expose a killer's guilt by drawing conclusions. <laughs> 